Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik with Breakthrough News. I'm Zoe Alexander with People's Dispatch. We're here in Mexico City and we're joined by Dr. Claudia Sheinbaum, the head of government of Mexico City and one of the founders of Morena Party of President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. She's a rising figure in Mexican politics and one of the front runners in the 2024 Mexican presidential elections. Dr. Sheinbaum, thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you for coming. So let's jump right into it. You studied environmental engineering in university, and today you are the head of government of one of the largest cities in the world, over 20 million people in Mexico City. And you're also one of the founders of the largest progressive political party in the region, Morena. Can you tell us about your journey into politics? You went from student activism to being an elected official. What were your politics like growing up? Well, first of all, uh, my, my background is physics. I studied physics, then uh, energy engineering for my master and my PhD. And uh, when I was uh, 15 years old, that was the first time that I, when I was in uh, high school, uh, the first time that I get involved in uh, the student uh, mobilization, uh, the student movement because many people couldn't get in into the high school. So I was in, but I was, you know, in solidarity with those that couldn't have the possibility of studying. Uh, and then, you know, I get involved in social politics. <clears throat> and it was very important for us in 1988, <clears throat> when the Ingeniero Cárdenas was uh, um, a candidate for presidency. And it was very important for us because we came from a student movement and we decided, I said us because our generation, and we decided to go to Ingeniero Cárdenas. <clears throat> and later on, I you know, went to the US to study my PhD. And then I returned and I was uh, part of the university. Uh, but I was involved from my parents that they were involved in the 1968 student movement. So I was involved in politics. Uh, but my main occupation was to be a mother <laughs> and uh, to be in the university. And in 2000, uh, President Lopez Obrador, when he was chief of government of Mexico City, he invited me to be the Minister of Environment. And I get involved and later on in 2006 with the uh, electoral fraud, uh, I, you know, I was you know, with Lopez Obrador even though I returned to university. I was, you know, with him in all the movement that finally get into the um, burn of, of Morena. Great. Well, we know that PRI and PAN really maintained a stranglehold over Mexican politics since 1946. In 2016, Morena was founded to be an alternative to this. Um, and in 2018, of course, Morena achieved a historic electoral victory with the election of Andres eh, Manuel López Obrador. What does this mean for the course of Mexican politics? You know, in 2016, when Morena was created, nobody wanted to be in Morena <laughs> because it was a new party. And in Mexico, you have to win a certain percentage of the votes uh, to be an official party. And it was very difficult because uh, just few people wanted to be in Morena. And uh, the decision to get away from PRD, the, the party that we were, is that, you know, we thought at that time that uh, there was no possibility in that party that was uh, getting very close to the uh, official party. Uh, so we decided to create. I said we decided because there were a lot of assemblies in all the country that decided to create this party. And uh, from 2016, to 2022, it's, you know, uh, seven years. And uh, now we have, you know, the presidency, um, 22 governors of, of 32, uh, the majority in the Congress, the majority in the Senate, and uh, a lot of municipal presidentials. Why? It's because people want to change. Uh, and uh, it's a change from economic model. We, uh, you know, neoliberalism was, now is in the past. And uh, we have now a government that thinks in the majority, thinks in Mexican people rather 
than things in a privileged group. So, uh, and right now we have the majority, and that's because uh, people are, you know, happy. Even though a lot of media is against the president and against Morena, you know, people wants, wants this change and wants uh, this fourth transformation, as we call it, to continue. So one, one thing that confirms some of what you're saying is the fact that you're currently leading all major voter intention polls for the 2024 presidential election. What do you think has led to this support? Okay, first of all, I think it's that I have been uh, in the movement always. Um, I've been near President Lopez Obrador, you know, always uh, since 2000. Uh, 23 years, um, and uh, at some point people remember that I was, you know, in in the Adelitas movement <laughs> that we have in 2008 against the privatization of of oil, of the Mexican oil, um, of Pemex, uh, and I was, you know, in in many movements. Uh, so they think that I can continue what President Lopez Obrador is doing. The second thing is uh, who I am <laughs> and what I have done in Mexico City. Uh, if they didn't like a scientist uh, and a politic to be a president, they, you know, uh, they probably don't prefer myself. And also my work in Mexico City, if my job here in Mexico had been bad and people were you know, against me, but probably I couldn't go you know, to the next step. And finally, believe it or not, is because I'm a woman. You know, it's uh, now uh, time for, for women. It's uh, incredibly, it's not only the social movement of uh, young women, and uh, it's also that uh, in Mexico, we have already nine governors and many women participating in politics, so it's not a strange. And, uh, at some point, people see that it's uh, good to have a, a president, a female president. Well, we'd like to talk about one of those reasons that you spoke about, which is uh, your role as head of government in Mexico City. Uh, again, a city of over 20 million people, which is very significant. Um, and you were elected by popular vote again in uh, 2018. As head of government, you've taken on many initiatives to address some of the structural issues facing the city. And one of them that we'd like to talk about is, of course, uh, femicide and the issue of women, uh, which is a huge challenge for Mexico. It's a huge challenge for the region as in general. Um, but in your role, you've taken a lot of different initiatives um, to address this issue, to make the city a safer place for women. So can you talk a bit about those initiatives? Yes, in November 2019, I decided to make a, uh, an alarm for women. Uh, we could say that. And... Uh, so I, we developed 11 points for women to be safe in the city. Um, and we have now uh, done more than that. Uh, I can tell you some examples. For example, we have 27 centers to attend uh, uh, women that uh, have violence at home. Uh, we have passed many laws. Uh, one that I like to, uh, to say in many places is that you know, when we think uh, violence in, in, in the household um, or in families, uh, what we think is let's take the woman and uh, her children to a refuge. Refu refu yeah. How do you say it? In refuge. Place? Refuge? Yeah. Uh, so I asked myself, why do you have to take out the women and put it and hide her, right? So now we have a law here in Mexico City that it's... Uh, the aggressor goes out of the of the house, so even uh, if the property is not uh, of the women, mm -hmm. of the woman, of of her, uh, she has the right to stay at home, um, and the man or the aggressor uh, has prevental uh, measures, or even he goes to jail if uh, you know the judge decided. So it's a complete different uh, way of thinking. Um, and also we have made 800 uh, kilometers of safe uh, corridors, 
with a lot of light and, uh, and uh, buttons for, um, for help, mm -hmm. um, for, for the police to come. Um, we have a special number, it's uh, 765 to call for if you have, if you are, you have problems, if you're a woman, and many other things that, uh, so in, we don't know if there are more feminicides now than before, because before they were not counted, but we have to take care of that. And I mean, you've dealt with so many other issues as well. One of the biggest ones affecting the entire planet, of course, is climate change. And you're an environmental engineer. As you mentioned, you were also Secretary of Environment. And you were part of the UN panel on climate change in 2007, which won a Nobel Peace Prize. And Mexico City, like all major cities, deals with many issues related to this, such as access to water or pollution, just the general impact of climate change. During your time in office, what have been major initiatives that you've taken up to address these issues that affect everybody? Okay, we have our own uh, environmental and climate change program for the city. And um, I can tell you some of the things that we have done. Uh, we have uh, planted about 35 million of trees and plants in the city. Uh, compared to the last four years before I entered the government, it's about 10 times. Uh, second, um, we have made a lot of investment in electromobility, but for public transportation. So we have the two cable cars, uh, the longer cable cars for public transport in the world. Uh, one is in Iztapalapa, the, the uh, west part of the city, and the other one is the north part. And especially for the poor people that live in, uh, in the mountains that go to the metro. Uh, one is 10 kilometers and the other one is almost 10 kilometers. Um, and uh, they moved around um, 120,000 uh, personas. 120,000. That's right. Um, and then uh, we, we have already 500 trolleys in the city. <laughs> Uh, we made a, a second floor, but not for, for cars, uh, only for uh, trolleys, uh, eight kilometer second, second tier. So moving to another one of those reasons that you mentioned before, which is, of course, the transformation. Um, the fourth transformation has been the guiding project of your party, Morena. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting if you can tell us a bit about what does the uh, fourth transformation mean? What has it accomplished so far? Um, and for you, what is the vision for continuing this project and what's left? Okay, we call it fourth transform transformation because since uh, we are a nation, we have had three transformations before. The first one is the independence that began in 1810. The second one was the reform with Benito Juarez. We divided the church from the state and we have also the uh, French invasion and the U.S. invasion. Uh, so 19th century, especially the second half of, of 19th century was very important for, for Mexico. And then for many, many years, uh, we have a dictator that was Porfirio Diaz. So the third transformation was the Mexican Revolution, which um, uh, changed, you know, uh, uh, the government, not only for more democracy, but to see the government for the uh, social uh, rights. Uh, these three transformations were violent. Uh, there were wars. There were wa wars. And uh, the fourth transformation is pacific, uh, because we believe in peace. Um, and what have changed? We, uh, you, you know, in 2008, in December, we can say that the economic model changed uh, from neoliberalism uh, that it, at some point in Mexico it's equal to corruption mm. and also to give most of the national um, uh, uh, natural resources to private companies to a new way of govern that uh, now we call it um, Mexican humanism. Uh, 
And it's uh, mainly, it's, uh, we believe in, in private investment. We believe in, in trade, of course, in free trade. Uh, we have a, a trade with the US and Canada. But we believe that the states have to give the rights for the people. Uh, what do we think is a right? Education, health, uh, household, uh, or, or, or uh, dwelling, um, 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 pension for, for all the old elders. And uh, we believe that government has, and also we believe in, in that strategic areas of economy, such as energy, the state has to be part of, of this, especially electricity, oil, um, and mainly, and now uh, lithium, that it's, it's going to be very important. It's important and it's going to be very important in the future. So it's, it's you know, the, the basic, but we believe also in trade, we believe, you know, in, in private investment, and, but we believe in, in, in wealth for Mexican people. Uh, you cannot have private investment measured only by GDP or um, international investment. You have to uh, measure investment, public and private, in wealth for the people. And that's, you know, the big difference with neoliberalism that believed that everything was going to be solved by the market. So also with regards to the region, we've seen many significant electoral victories of the left, of progressive forces across Latin America, uh, in Honduras, Bolivia, Brazil, and Colombia. What is the significance of this progressive resurgence for Mexico, and how does Mexico see itself as part of this? It's, it's something it's very special, what is uh, happening right now in Latin America. And uh, I think uh, people decided that uh, the old model uh, was bringing uh, inequalities and corruption in many parts. And people want to have a government that look for the people who, who uh, have less, you know, historically. And that's very important because, um, you know, in, in many parts, I mean, from my generation, we always think Latin America as the patria grande, you know, and um, so for me, you know, it's it's something incredible that it's happening. Now we have to give results. This progressive wave is distinct in the presence of more female leaders, people like Ziamara Castro, Cristina Fernandez, uh, Francia Marquez, and then Mexico, of course, just hosted the Feminist International, uh, which was a gathering of all these female leaders from across the region. How do you see all of this in relation to the rising tide of feminism across the region? I mean, it's, it's obvious that uh, uh, women are, you know, getting more in public life um, because of the feminist movement, because of the young um, women that have said, you know, uh, stop violence and uh, stop especially sexual violence. Uh, so this is very important. What I think, and I, I spoke in this, in this uh, international congress, and I said, um, let's speak about a social feminist, feminism. Uh, what do I think about it? Uh, we women, um, we have probably the same problems, but there are some women that suffer more. Uh, in Mexico City, we made a survey. Who is more discriminated in Mexico City? And it's because of uh, the color of your skin, it's because if you're indigenous, and it's because if you're women. So if you are, uh, if you have, uh, uh, um, if you're not white, if you're women and you're indigenous, you're going to be more discriminated. And it's not the same for a white uh, woman. So we have to think about it. It's not only, you know, the same for everybody. So Mexico has historic ties with the people of Cuba. And in the last several years, 
under the leadership of Andres Manuel, there has been many important advances uh, with regards to economic and medical cooperation. Of course, the, the U.S. blockade presents many challenges to this. Um, but for you, what do you see as the major barriers um, to furthering integration amongst the people of the region and specifically, of course, with the people of Cuba? Okay, we are against any kind of, um, how do you say it in English, uh, bloqueo? El, blockade. The blockade. Because people suffer from that. It's not just that you're against certain government, but people suffer. And uh, even though this blockade, you know, people of Cuba has, you get, you know, uh, um, you know, their own path. You know, medicine in Cuba is incredible uh, compared to many other countries in the world. So Cubans have to decide what is going to happen with Cuba. And people of uh, any other countries are going to decide. That's uh, a principle of uh, foreign policy in Mexico. It's in the consti Constitution, mm -hmm. you know, the sovereignty of any country. And especially, you know, we have ties uh, with Cuba. And uh, right now we are, you know, we have been benefit from uh, Cuban uh, uh, doctors that are coming to Mexico. Because in the, other, in, in the last decade, uh, you know, uh, medical schools have closed so much that we don't have enough doctors. So we are looking in any country that want to help us to have a good public health system. And the Cuban says, we help you. So we are receiving that help and we are paying for, for that uh, service. Uh, and we are paying doctors as, as if any other country have said that. And that benefits uh, Cuba. So, uh, you know, they have to decide what's, what's their food, the future, not any other, anybody else. And you mentioned the issue of sovereignty. As I'm, as I'm sure you've seen, we have these conservative politicians in the US that have been making these very provocative statements about military intervention in Mexico under the guise of fighting drug cartels. And this comes after AMLO has nationalized the country's lithium industry, which they're not so happy about. And he's also emphasized the importance of Mexican sovereignty. So what's your position on U.S. interference in Mexico? I'm against it. <laughs> <laughs> As uh, I'm okay. against, you know, uh, intervention in any other country. Um, um, why in Mexico? Um, you know, the, the drug uh, market between Mexico and the U.S., it's because in the U.S. have been, are, you know, in history, more consumers than in Mexico. So if we want to stop that, it's not just violence. It's to talk to young people that uh, drugs make, uh, you know, especially fentanilo, you know, fentanyl, uh, destroy uh, human lives. But it's, uh, it's cooperation, it's not invasion. So, uh, oh, you say that, invasion? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's not violence, you know. We, we have to work together to stop uh, the consumption and to stop the, the market of uh, fire guns mm. um, that come mainly from the U.S. So it's, you know, it's mutual. So we have to work together, not, you know, uh, this uh, thing that it's just, I think, propagandistic. Mm. Uh, but we have to defend Mexico at all points. So over the past several months, there have been very uh, large and important mobilizations in support of uh, President Andres Manuel, of the project of Morena, the fourth transformation, in support of the nationalization of lithium. Um, there's now one more year left of uh, AMLO's term as president. Can you maybe just to finalize this interview, if we can kind of talk a bit about these last few years, uh, Morena being in power and really, what has this meant for the people of Mexico? Okay, it, it meant uh, uh, general um, uh, pension for elder people. It meant a lot of scholarship for poor people, uh, universal um, 
scholarship for high school uh, students that go to public schools. Uh, we have, we're going to have a new uh, train in, in the south of, of the country, another train that goes from the Pacific to the Atlantic, to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we're going to have uh, several ports. We are going to have a lot of investment in new roads. Uh, not we're going to have, we have already. Uh, uh, we have a new airport. So if you take you know, the last uh, governments and this government, we have a lot of public investment. Uh, the highest uh, foreign investment in Mexico and you have at the same time new rights for the people. And uh, that's why people are, you know, with President Lopez Obrador in 70%, is because they see that this new government change and is a uh, benefit uh, for everybody. And he fought for Mexico and he fought for um, uh, a new way of seeing history. Uh, uh, even for uh, our ancient cultures. Um, so Mexico have changed a lot uh, in more than four years, I mean, a lot. And uh, the way I see it is that, I mean, people love this change, the, the majority, of course, and people love their president because he have won the, the heart of the people, because he's a president that have fought for them uh, for 25 years. I mean, you, you cannot write the Mexican history the first 25 years, a quarter, the first quarter of the 21st century without Lopez Obrador. He has changed a lot in Mexico and with a social movement that, it, that you know, went with him, but he has been the, the head of that. So, uh, you know, things are changing for good in Mexico. And I think that we have to continue this transformation. We cannot go to the corruption and to, um, to the old governments that only did something for privileged people. Uh, so we are in peace. We have uh, um, political peace. Uh, we have uh, social peace. Uh, we have violence in certain points of the country because of drug cartels, uh, but we, we have to continue giving rights for the people and at the same time uh, combating, you know, the drug cartels and every violence that have, that are in Mexico. So it's, uh, uh, we're in a good place right now. <laughs> well, Dr. Scheinbaum, we want to thank you so much for joining us and giving us your time. No, thank you very much for you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>